On December 23, 1997, Kazunori Yamauchi wandered through the maze-like streets of Tokyo. He had barely stepped foot outside for the past five years. He'd been literally living in a different world, a virtual one. Cooped up in an office with a small team of programmers, he'd spent that half a decade building a completely new sort of racing game, a game he'd dreamed of since childhood. In that time, he'd slept most nights under his desk. Just like when he was a kid, his dreams must have been filled with visions of cars zooming around tracks in an endless loop. Now, Kazunori's quest was complete. He'd been awakened from his trance-like state and returned to the real world, where he now had nowhere in particular to be. It was a cold and overcast winter day in Tokyo, but Kazunori noticed masses of people lining up outside the city's ubiquitous tech stores. The crowds were there to buy Kazunori's game, the one he'd been working tirelessly to create for half a decade, although none of the people would have recognized the man who was now watching them from a distance. If you haven't already guessed, Kazunori's passion project was Gran Turismo for the PlayStation. The game would be a smash hit, spawning an enduring franchise that would permanently change not just the world of racing games, but car culture as a whole. So how did Gran Turismo actually get made? And what about its competitors? Similarly groundbreaking games of the late 90s and early 2000s like Need for Speed, Burnout, and Midnight Club. What made these games so special? So much so that they're still relevant today. Well, upgrade your air intake, get some lens cleaners on those CD-ROMs, and make your buddy use the Mad Cats controller, because today on Past Gas, it's inside the race to make the greatest racing game of all time. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about forts. Hell yeah, buddy. These games are my childhood right here. That's what I'm talking about. I completely forgot about Mad Cat's controllers up until right now. Oh, dude, you gotta have the turbo button on there. I'm still not. Sh I'm still not sure what it does. I'm trying to understand why everyone had a Mad Cat's because they, I don't think they were like less expensive than a normal controller. No, they were. They were about ten dollars less. Oh, they were okay. cheaper, and you can buy them at Blockbuster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's yeah. true. So like you're, you're like renting a game, and you're like, oh, we need another controller. Oh, uh, Simon spending the night. Yeah, we need I another forgot. Controller. Simon was here. He's like, man, should have told me I could have brought mine. <laughs> now I got to use this. I think what? they went out of business because this is a total wild guess. But, um, you know, during this era when they were popular, like couch multiplayer was a lot more popular. That was like the only form of, of multiplayer was playing it with your mm -hmm. friends at your house. But since online multiplayer took over... I mean, when I had my PS3, I never bought another controller for that because I would play online. Uh, I yeah. don't have a current console, but I'm assuming that I'll probably only have one controller for the PS5 when that comes out. Did you see this Mad Cat's the authentic rat mouse? Uh, oh, <laughs> I've seen the rat. I know the rat. Yep. <laughs> what is going on with it? <laughs> it has just enough like pad space for just the bare minimum of what you're touching on the mouse, yeah. right? It's like crazy. Looks like a ship from Terminator. <laughs> it's not a mouse. It's a rat. It's a rat. <laughs> it's a rat. R-A-T. <laughs> Are they still selling that? Yeah, it's yeah. on the, uh, right here. Used. Dang. I might have to buy that. I, I might have to get one of those and review it for next episode, just like I promised I would buy the Garfield racing game and uh, oh, review yeah, it for like, next episode. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh... uh uh, kind of sucks. Uh, <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. Uh, the, so there's there's two Garfield racing games. They're both available on Steam. The first one is five dollars, and I quickly discovered why it's five dollars because it runs like absolute dog <laughs> on PC, and that's because I found out it was actually a port of a mobile game, which they brought over to computers. Oh, okay. So it's not optimized for that. Uh, so the sequel. I think it's called Furious Racing. It should have been called Furious Racing. It should have been called Lasagna Town Racing. <laughs> a Tale of Two Kitties. Um, I was really into Garfield as a kid. It was Garfield, Farside, and Calvin and Hobbes for me. That's besides the point. As a Garfield fan, I was disappointed by the game, and I don't recommend that you buy it, dear listener. What about, so what you about can... Foxtrot? Is there a Foxtrot cart game? I don't know. That makes sense. But... I, they did not have Foxtrot in my newspaper, so I'm not like a huge Foxtrot fan. What's that no, political yeah. cartoon that was never funny? Dunesbury? Uh, oh, oh hell Dunesbury. yeah. I want a Dunesbury <laughs> cart racer. <laughs> hell yeah, dude. <laughs> Should we do introductions? Oh, yeah. Hey, welcome to Pass Gas, <laughs> number one automotive history podcast. 
uh, as decided by me. I am your host, Nolan Sykes, <laughs> as always, with my other two hosts, James Pumphrey. Did you see the size of that airplane last night? <laughs> New catchphrase every week. Still going strong. The guy strong. who's never seen an airplane before. <laughs> He's seen a little one. <laughs> and Joe Weber. Uh, fired up. As we said in the intro, we're, ta- we're talking about er- late 90s, early 2000s uh, racing games. Probably uh, my, that's that's my wheelhouse. I'll say it because, uh, you know, that that's the time when I was getting into gaming and racing games are my favorite. Did you guys have a lot of uh, experience with these this era of racing game? Yep. I'd say this is my... This is my time for video games as well. Late 90s, early 2000s. Um, I'm a PlayStation boy. I'm an N64 boy. I did have a Sega Saturn. Wow. Um, so what was your first game that came with the... With the Sega Saturn. Yeah. It came with Virtua Cop. Okay. <laughs> I've heard of that. Virtua Fighter. And then like Day like Daytona 500 Racing. Or oh, something. gotcha. That's fun. Joe, what was your first game that you got... So I had I had a hand me down NES when I was a kid, and Contra was my first first like oh nice exposure to games. But then I did, it was like a long time before I got another console. The first racing game that I remember being like, whoa, this is like the future. Um, my friend Sean had been pushed over the back of a like a a golf bag that was laying on the ground, and he his arm snapped, and mm-hmm. I went to like bring his homework to him. And he was playing Gran Turismo on PlayStation 2. And I remember he had an NSX and he was doing like an endurance race. Oh, nice. That was like my first like, whoa, this is what I want at my house. (laughs) This is what I want to do for a living. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) My first first game that I bought with that PlayStation 2 was Stuntman, which uh, sucked. Um, yeah, not a great game, really long load times. I remember. And then I got burnout too, which is still one of my favorite burnout is so fun. Burnout. So fun. It really hit its stride at burnout three, but burnout two is also a very good game. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get into it without further ado, man. The loading time on this podcast is so long. I don't like all the cut scenes. Just tell me about the games. <laughs> For the first 20 years of their existence, racing games forced you to compromise. You could either play a fun arcade style game like Mario Kart with no basis in reality. Sorry, character, that is literally a mushroom. Or you could play a hardcore simulation like the aptly named Indianapolis 500, The Simulation, which, while impressively close to the experience of racing on an oval for three hours, was only fun to the most hardcore of oval fans. Today's story begins in 1992, when Nintendo had just released Mario Kart for the Super Nintendo system. Shigeru Miyamoto, the legendary creator of Mario and Zelda, had overseen its development, and just like his other games, it was nearly impossible to put down, as addictive as real-life arcade games. A blue shell to the dome for actual arcades. The race for racing game dominance would now be fought almost exclusively on the home entertainment front. In another prefecture of Tokyo, at Sony headquarters, Kazunori Yamauchi was entering the picture. Kazunori saw a third path, somewhere between Nintendo's Rainbow Road and the Hardcore Simulator Highway. He wanted to make a driving game that was both realistic and fun. Unlike many racing game developers, Kazunori lived and breathed cars. As a kid, his family had owned a porcelain shop, and he would watch cars driving by from the front window asking his dad to make and model of every single one. I'm trying to focus on porcelain right now. Stop asking me about cars. (laughs) I'm making toilets and figurines. Hummels. (laughs) Yeah, Hummels. I I couldn't remember. We've got a large, yeah, large range here at this here porcelain shop. Um, You can't see it in the background of the video, but Nolan has one of the largest Hummel collections in North America. Yeah, I really love those uh, precious moments collectibles. (laughs) Uh, One of his happiest, one of Kazunori's happiest memories was hopping in the car when his dad would make deliveries. He just wanted to be in the car. By the time he was a teenager, he visited the arcades, but was unimpressed by the racing games of the early 80s. In his words, quote, I thought to myself, this isn't it. I want to drive real cars. When Kazunori was 24, he purchased his first car, 
a Nissan Skyline GTR R32. Whoa. Damn, son. At 24. First car. Uh, this guy had taste. Six months into driving the car, he crashed it driving 125 miles per. The man also loved speed. Yamauchi survived the crash and went on to design games at Sony during the 16-bit era of the 80s. His dream project, however, was a driving sim that felt like a game, realistic and fun. He would call it Gran Turismo. In 1992, two years before the release of the PlayStation 1, Kazunori pitched his game to Sony. They said no. But the story didn't end there. When Sony declined Kazunori's Gran Turismo pitch, they left the door just a tiny little bit open. Instead of approving a driving simulator, which the executives worried would be too boring to attract a wider audience, they approved Yamauchi to make a Mario Kart type arcade racing game. After all, the Nintendo game was selling incredibly well, and Sony wanted to make sure they had a similar title for the launch of the PlayStation 1. This game would be Motor Toon Grand Prix, a kart racing game with coins and power-ups that included a, quote, crazy mushroom. Sound familiar? Despite its obvious resemblance to Mario Kart, Motor Toon boasted some unique innovations. Under its deceptively zany aesthetic, YouTube commenter Aquafresh193 described it as a, quote, Gran Turismo on acid and 50 gallons of Hennessy, LOL. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. He's a credible <laughs> commenter. <laughs> Very prolific. <laughs> the game featured realistic physics that would foreshadow Kazunori's next project. In fact, Motor Tune Grand Prix was little more than a Technicolor Trojan horse for Gran Turismo. In the words of Yamauchi, I came up with the idea of making a video game with a different appearance, and we hid Gran Turismo within the game while maintaining the look of video games that were popular at the time. Really cool. I remember seeing this, seeing like maybe it was on the TV at Blockbuster or something, mm -hmm. and be like, what is this? <laughs> Bootleg, <laughs> it's like Mario, Mario Kart. Kart. Yeah, this is definitely a, uh, you saw it, like we've all seen this game on the shelf at Blockbuster. Yeah. And been like, ah, I think I'm going to get Resident Evil. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really miss renting video games. That was like the best. It didn't happen very often, but like that was the best feeling ever. Like coaxing mom into renting a game for yeah. two days. Kids one would come out. You try to get there before they were all rented. Yeah. Kids don't, kids don't get that anymore. I don't think. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember when I was like probably eight or nine convincing my mom to rent a virtual boy console oh yeah oh wow really and yeah it was like a big deal i brought it home was like on my virtual boy playing tennis and i think like <laughs> some sort of f-zero game that um, that was like a helmet that you put on right yeah, yeah it was like early vr but it was just orange outlines <laughs> yeah <laughs> i always forget that nolan was like six in 2008 <laughs> no i was Six in 1999, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, um, we were 14. Dang, we would have not have hung out. That's for sure. No, man, that would have been weird <laughs> if we did. This? <laughs> yeah. So the reason for uh, Motor Tune Grand Prix's creation was that Kazunori's company, Polyphony Digital, was operating as a subsidiary of Sony. In his own words, quote, We secured the budget for creating Motor Tune Grand Prix, and we pushed the project forward. But in the background, we'd actually already started the development oh, of Gran Turismo what? right under their posh little noses. <laughs> we were already developing our dream game. When Motor Tune was released in December of 1994, two weeks after the launch of the PS1, it was well received by the Japanese audience, although it would never be released in the West, unfortunately. Kazunori had learned a valuable lesson, though. Video games were a business, and business people are inherently conservative. They want to make sure that their investments are solid before they back them. With Motor Tune, he was, in his words, quote, able to secure the trust of the executives to create games on my own. And that's when I presented Gran Turismo Project to them, and development officially started. As far as they knew, because remember, I had been developing Gran Turismo this whole time under the guise of creating Mototune GP. That was all artistic license. Uh, <laughs> that was not part of the quote. 
That was a recording of the guy himself. Now we'll return to Gran Turismo, but meanwhile, on the opposite side of the world, in a snowy country not known for video games, Electronic Arts Canada would release a game that would change the landscape of driving games during the years Gran Turismo was still in development. This was Road and Track Presents The Need for Speed, a game that let you choose between eight real-life sports cars, one for every word in the game's title. <laughs> The game was initially released on the short-lived 3DO console, the brainchild of Electronic Arts founder Trip Hawkins, which is a sick name. Sounds like a fake pilot's name. Or like a bully <laughs> in an 80s movie. There are 700 reasons why you may never have heard of the 3DO. One for every dollar in its eye-popping price tag. That's right. It cost $700 when it was launched Ooh. in 1993. That would be $1,260 <laughs> today. To wow. date, the 3DO is still the most expensive console ever sold adjusted for inflation. And because of its price, it failed to build a following. Why? Yeah. You, you, you can get the, the PS5 is out at the time of this airing. The top one is $499. You can get one for $399. Yeah, you could probably buy every system. You could get an Xbox, PS5, and a a a switch, switch. light for that price mm -hmm. that's pretty wow. amazing yeah for, when i was a kid like it it was like kind of like a legend like the no one had it yeah but they were like you, you know the 3do and you're like yeah of course the 3do but nobody <laughs> nobody can afford it and our parents aren't gonna buy us a 3do guys if we all chip in maybe we can buy a 3do together maybe when we're 40 <laughs> <laughs> in later years, uh, Need for Speed would be released on PC and PlayStation. Unlike Gran Turismo, which would focus on achieving realism from the design of a ground-up physics engine, Road and Track presents the Need for Speed, <laughs> focused on winning over driving enthusiasts by touting a collaboration with a venerable automotive magazine. Ah, yes. A trend that survives to this day. <laughs> Among Road and Track's contributions to the game was consultation on each car's handling and driving sounds, along with spoken commentary and short video clips set to rock and music. Oh, yeah. Wait, by today's standards. But back then, it was cutting edge. I mean, this is like not unlike Nolan and I being in Dirt 5, which is available now for download or smart delivery. That's true. These features are vintage 90s with plenty of shaky cam, digital blur, and typewriter fonts. The commentary is also something to behold. Over rocking, wailing riffs, a booming male announcer describes the specs of each car as if he's announcing a UFC title bout. To give you a taste from the description of the Mazda RX-7, Wheel hop off the line hinders drag strip starts, but once underway, the RX-7 is explosively fast. The transition from primary to secondary turbo operation is hardly noticeable. Handling is extremely responsive, and with 0.94G of lateral grip and only slight body roll, the RX-7 is second only to the Viper in its race car-like feel. <laughs> I actually kind of like that they really leaned into the magazine kind of vibe for the game. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, you're not... Yeah, when you're playing the game, you aren't going to notice that transition from primary to secondary turbo but operation. But they want you... Because it's probably not programmed into the game, right? The mind is a very powerful thing. Oh, and yeah. And suggestion, the power of suggestion is real. Yeah, I could see being like a six-year-old being like, oh, I felt that second turbo felt, kicking. Yeah, it's not as smooth as he thought. There's my wheel hop off the line. Oh, they said that. They said that would happen, and it did. No, you're actually you're actually really on point with that, James. Uh, when we were talking to the Dirt 5 developers for the, Dirt, uh, yeah. the, uh, like the video game wheelhouse that we put out, a lot of racing games will have visual damage, and players, I mean... There's cosmetic versus like mechanical damage in some mm -hmm. games, but a lot of games say they have damage. It's really just visual, and players think the cars drive differently, but mm -hmm. there's actually it's it's not possible for them to drive differently because that's not programmed in. So yeah. it's all about that that getting that mindset correct. Yeah, uh, there's even a history section for each vehicle, which was essentially a mid '90s prototype of past gas. Quote. 
The origin of the Supra dates back to 1971 when Toyota introduced the Celica as an economical four-cylinder sports car. Uh, perhaps the best road and track flavor, however, is the maximum hype descriptions of the tracks. From the tranquility of suburbia to the pandemonium of the urban jungle, this route opens up with gentle freeway and winds its way into the bowels of the city's underground. Roads snaking everywhere, underpasses, overpasses, concrete barriers, long winding tunnels. It's all here for you, Damien. <laughs> You're just sitting on your couch like, what? <laughs> Exploring the game's features gives insight into what would specifically appeal to a driving enthusiast in the mid-90s. With the internet and YouTube, a list of stats and videos of cars are literally in our pockets, a couple of taps and swipes away at all times. But back in 1994, to page through glossy images, click on videos, and listen to an announcer read to you must have felt downright futuristic. Like when Neo loads Kung Fu into his brain in the Matrix. <laughs> oh, yeah. Freed from the arcade, video game companies were starting to think of their products as multimedia experiences. And in this case, a game that felt like driving into the pages of a car magazine. I think that's really cool. Yeah. As for the gameplay, Need for Speed shared the limitations of previous games. You had a limited selection of eight cars and six tracks. These cars included the previously mentioned RX-7 as well as the Acura NSX, the Chevrolet Corvette ZR1, Ferrari 512TR, and Porsche 911 Carrera, to name a few. Which is interesting because Porsche didn't let people use their cars in games a whole lot. This was the the one game that they had like a contract with for 20 years. Yeah. They had a, they had a contract with EA and they yeah. actually made it. There was a Porsche. There was a need for speed, like only Porsche edition, which only I had Porsches that. in it. And this is, this is why this is the, this is the franchise. Why? If you completed the tournament mode, you gained access to a fictional neon purple jet powered sports car called the warrior PTO E slash two. You could change the view to first person and drive with an accurately reproduced dashboard in front of you. Although, it's a little odd to see the steering wheel turn with no hands on it. In this world, you are invisible. Uh, a memorable feature of the game was the inclusion of police vehicles. As the race is underway, there's a chance that a police car will pursue you and give you a ticket, slowing you down. Three tickets and you're shown a video of a sheriff with a shotgun delivering lines like, Congratulations, you've just won an all-expenses-paid county vacation <laughs> before hauling you off to jail. The feature was a hit, and EA would focus on police chases and even let you drive as one of the cops in future games, including the Hot Pursuit and Most Wanted series. Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2, one of my favorite games of all time. Other features were small, but still notable for the time. Compared to previous racing games, there was an increased emphasis on braking and cornering. An on-screen map aided in navigation. You could actually angle yourself in front of other cars to prevent them from overtaking. And the car had a functioning rear view mirror to assist your defensive driving. Like many of its predecessors, improvements were incremental, slow and steady progress that by the end of the decade would speed up exponentially. Even though arcade gaming was on the decline in the U.S. because of the increasing dominance of console and PC home gaming, 1994 saw the release of two games that would show that arcade games were still relevant in the 90s, albeit in a greatly reduced role. The first of these was Sega's Daytona USA. That's an arcade classic, in my opinion. So, yeah, this was a, a follow-up to OutRun. In Daytona USA, you drive a NASCAR named The Hornet, uh, one of the tracks included a Mount Rushmore style mountain with Sonic the Hedgehog etched into the side of it. Awesome. Um, the second of these arcade games also owed a great debt to OutRun. It was a Nintendo designed game licensed by Midway called Cruisin' USA. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Stages include the Golden Gate Park, Death Valley, Appalachia, and the Grand Canyon. Written in the Cruisin' USA's DNA was an omen of its own demise. It ran on Nintendo's Ultra 64 hardware, a precursor to the Nintendo 64 system, which was in development at the time. What does that mean? Essentially, in terms of hardware, arcades were merely a couple of years ahead of home consoles in terms of what they could offer consumers. 
Although Daytona USA and Cruisin' USA would prove to be enduring hits and a staple of pizza parlors for years to come, they were old dogs with new chips. Keep in mind that the year that these games were released was the same year you could play Need for Speed, sitting on your couch, no quarters required. I would love to go to a pizza parlor right now. Oh, oh me yeah. too. Even if it was fun. Shakey's and I know that I'm going to get a stomach ache. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had a round table pizza near my house that had like a little arcade room. I could still smell that room. You yeah. know, like the, the, the greasy carpet in there. Yeah. The sticky buttons because like people would spill soda all over those things. Real quick note about round table. That round table pizza in Atascadero became Central Coast Pizza because round table dipped out. And then they built a round table down the street like three years later, and everybody stopped going to Central Coast Pizza, which was great. No. And then they went to Round Table instead, and Central Coast Pizza closed, and I've, I'll never forgive my townsfolk for that. Isn't Round Table bad pizza? Uh, it's all right, but like Central Coast Pizza was so much better, and I'm, I'm still bitter about it. Yeah, I want to go to a place that's called like Gino's. Gino's, baby. Like Giovanni's Pizza Pie and Parlor. <laughs> Uh, Totino's. <laughs> DiGiorno's. I want to go to a place, a real authentic place called DiGiorno's or, or Baboli. A Kirkland signature. <laughs> Red Baron's. <laughs> yep, guys, those are all uh, pizza, frozen pizza brands. <laughs> Very impressive list. You put your three heads together and you named quite a few. <laughs> A big old thanks to Caliper CBD for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. You know, what's great about CBD is that you get a lot of health benefits without making a lot of drastic changes to your regimen. You know, I use CBD to calm down. Sometimes it's, uh, it helps motivate me to feel better. And Caliper is cool because it's a powder, it's tasteless, mixes into any food or drink, which is really cool. No weird taste or mouth feel or residue. And you, you know, that can kind of ruin your perception of CBD. There's 20 milligrams in each pouch. Each pack comes with a bunch of pouches, so you don't have to worry about storing it. It's, uh, it's individually wrapped. And you also don't have to worry about how much you're taking. You know exactly how much is in each packet. You can throw it in your smoothie, you throw it in your coffee. You can put it in a mocktail, a cocktail, protein shake. It doesn't matter, it doesn't taste like anything. It's so versatile. Caliper CBD powder is actually clinically proven to be superior to standard CBD oils. You've always heard that like water and oil don't mix. Well, your body is mostly water. So if you're drinking water with Caliper CBD in it, it's more likely to absorb within your body. Caliper CBD comes in affordable 30 and 60 count packs. Like I said, it's super convenient. Everything is individually wrapped, so you can take a couple wherever you go. Take a couple to the skate park, throw it in your Nalgene. And everything is non-GMO, which is like, if you're into that, you don't have to worry about it. No artificial chemicals or flavors or anything like that. And if you're worried about like, you know, well, this comes from marijuana, I don't know. It doesn't have any THC, so it's not gonna get you high. It's only the best medical benefits from that plant. You have nothing to worry about. It's all good stuff. But the best part is you can get 20% off your first order when you use the promo code GAS at trycaliper.com slash gas. You can try Caliper CBD risk-free for 30 days. If you don't love it, they're gonna give you a full refund so that you have nothing to lose. That's trycaliper.com slash GAS. And don't forget to use the promo code GAS for 20% off your first order. Thank you, Caliper. What's up, guys? I want to give a thanks to our sponsor this week, Hawthorne. You know, I've been thinking about making some personal changes lately, trying to get myself out of some ruts. I want to improve my self-care routine. It's very popular right now, taking care of yourself. The problem was I had no idea where to start. Then I found Hawthorne. Hawthorne is a premium tailored personal care brand that's making it super easy for guys to smell and feel amazing. Okay, it all starts with a quiz. They ask you some questions like, uh, what's your favorite drink? How do you like to spend a night out? Do you smoke? You take the super easy quiz, it takes like five minutes, and based on those answers, they compile for you suggested products. Products like my personal favorites. I got a Hawthorne face lotion, it's aloe based, and some facial cleanser. Honestly, I've been glowing lately and it's all thanks to Hawthorne, okay? I also use their body wash and their shampoo and all that. I use pretty much their entire line of products. <laughs> And I feel amazing. It's great to start your day uh, with a with a good routine that makes you feel good. 
and makes you uh, ready to take on the day. It's really great. If you want to upgrade your self-care routine, guys, Hawthorne is a fun and convenient way to get super high quality products tailored specifically for your needs. Hawthorne even takes the risk out of it by giving you free shipping on your order and your returns. And if you don't like their products, they'll even retail them based on your feedback. How about that? So do what I did. Take Hawthorne's quiz today and get started on your personalized self-care routine by going to hawthorne.co and use promo code GAS to get 10% off your first purchase. That's H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O, promo code GAS, hawthorne.co promo code gas thank you very much hawthorne for sponsoring this episode seriously get some of your get you some of that face lotion some of you guys are kind of dry out there okay it's winter is here hawthorne check it out within the world of driving games a new thing that nobody knew they were missing had a name gran turismo as we established in the opening of this episode this sony produced game changer quite literally a game changer was taking five years to develop from its inception in the motor tune grand prix days of 1992 to its release at the end of 1997. While five years is now a typical development window for major video game releases, in the 90s, it was nearly unheard of. For context, Ridge Racer, a popular launch day racing game for the PlayStation 1, had a development time of only eight months. Good Lord. I bet there's a bunch of bugs in that one. Nah, dude, yeah, no way. As the leader of the team, Kazunori Yamauchi had an uncanny ability for blue sky conceptual thinking and the years that Sony gave him allowed him to put all of his energy into making his dream a reality. In the documentary Kaz, K-A-Z, pushing the virtual divide, Kazunori recalled that as a child, his parents would pin large sheets of papers to the wall of their house. Kazunori was encouraged to draw whatever he wanted on them. And once he'd filled the pages, they would be taken down and replaced with fresh ones. From a young age, he was literally being trained not just to see the big picture, but to create it. To keep costs low and allow for a long development time, Kazunori kept his team small, finding coders who had worked on 3D graphics and physics engines. For those years, Kazunori would only go home perhaps four times a year. Like to his house? That's what I'm saying. He and his co-workers... Or to, or like to his house or like to his like hometown? His, he and his co-workers, James, would typically sleep under their desks and resume working as soon as they My got God. up. Although it sounds like a crunch that most game devs are now familiar with, Kazunori remembers it differently as an incredibly fun, exciting time. You know, looking back on it, it was probably fun, but there was probably some pretty crummy days, I have to imagine. Yeah, can you imagine what that place smelt like? Just a oh, bunch no. of nerds <laughs> sleeping. Oh no, I need to replace my zero and my one keys. I need to leave <laughs> for the first time in four months. Uh, his team started with just a handful of coders, growing to 20 near the end of the process, and the small group was encouraged to experiment. Kaz's obsession was not with making Gran Turismo punishingly realistic, although some players found it to be, but as intuitive as real-life driving. In his words, quote, Driving a real car is not supposed to be hard. It's often easier than driving inside a simulator. People are able to naturally know to counter steer when the car is sliding. So I've always had this conviction that if I can get the physics to be very accurate, then the driving in the game would not be difficult. Very smart. To achieve this realism, Kaz focused on building a physics engine from the ground up. All previous driving games had to some extent faked their physics by creating animations that mimicked the behavior of a car drifting on a turn or screeching to a stop. The Daytona 500 felt like that. Yep. I was like, yeah, I don't really buy that I'm like sliding out this much. Exactly. The Gran Turismo designers would go beyond mimicry and into the realm of replication by building into their code data like the actual weight of the car, the torque of the engine, and the grip of the tires. That's so cool. I love Back it. Back in the 90s. Yeah. It's nuts. When Sony executives finally got to take a look at the prototype of Gran Turismo, they were blown away. Not just by the driving physics, but by an all-new feature for racing games, reflection mapping on the vehicles. As the cars moved along the track, the lighting and reflections on the vehicle's surfaces would shift just like in real life, giving a sense of motion and speed that had never been before achieved. The importance of lighting in a video game cannot be overstated. In fact, Kaz himself once boasted that, quote, when somebody asks me, like at a restaurant, what type of work I do, sometimes my answer is that I work with light. All right, Kaz. 
All right, buddy. Oh, just like a direct. You're like a movie director. I work with light. Can you give me any more information. I'm I'm a cop. Yeah, kind of like know. Zeus. This is a uh, Zeus yeah. working with light. <laughs> a little bit like uh, a god. <laughs> On the gameplay side of things, Kaz seemed to understand another element of cars that makes them incredibly addictive. Something near and dear to our donut-shaped hearts. The ability to customize and tune your vehicles over time, adding and subtracting parts until there's barely anything left of the original. In Gran Turismo, tuning was turned into a quasi-RPG within the game. As you won races, you earned credits, which allowed you to buy parts to win more races. Garages and dealerships were actual locations you had to travel to within the game menu, giving you a sense that you were on some sort of driving-related quest. Me, personally, I hate the Gran Turismo menus. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. <laughs> they are so... I, I fired up Gran Turismo 5 the other day, and yeah. uh, it's just not a joy to find anything. I never played that late, but I do remember they really instill this feeling of like earning stuff. Because uh-huh. in the beginning, you have you can only afford like one of two cars. Yep. You have to like really battle it out to win a race, and then finally you can afford maybe like a new air intake or a new exhaust yep. or something. And it was like, oh man, finally I'm like my my Miata or whatever the car they give you in the beginning is like finally getting fast. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. true. Gran Turismo is distinct in that way, especially in the earlier titles where you really had to invest a lot of time in them before. Before you had any fun. Yeah, nowadays, with like Forza, I mean, it still kind of takes the time, but like Forza, is, it's somewhat easy to earn money and start getting cool cars pretty quickly. If these features that Gran Turismo had sound pretty routine, that's because RPG mechanics are now ubiquitous across nearly every genre of video game. But you have Gran Turismo in large part to thank for that. Of course, it's now morphed into in-game purchases and microtransactions, but that's a topic for another podcast. What it meant for Gran Turismo was that your car wasn't just an option you chose at a selection screen. Each vehicle was an evolving entity that you bought with hard-earned credits that you could grow genuinely attached to just like in real life. If Road and Track presents the need for speed presented you with the history of each car in the authoritative voice of Road and Track magazine, Gran Turismo took an opposite approach. It gave you the tools to write the story of the car in your own words. The vocabulary for those stories was also greatly expanded compared to previous games. On release, Gran Turismo offered 150 distinct vehicles. Wow. In the bizarro world of racing games, the most exotic cars are standard. Gran Turismo had the supercars, allowing you to drive an Aston Martin DB7, an Acura NSX, and a TVR Griffith, among others. But much more revelatory was the chance to get behind the wheel and customize cars like the Mitsubishi Eclipse, Subaru Legacy Wagon, and the Toyota AE86 Corolla. James is too busy living that right now. You don't drive it much. (laughs) Of course, Kaz also included his treasured Skyline R32 GTR. In fact, there are 13 different Skylines in the game with all of their specs faithfully recreated. That's something I do love doing is driving lower level cars in like Sims. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Even with the wish fulfillment, launch day, December 23rd, 1997, was a bittersweet moment for Kaz. As he wandered through Tokyo, in his words, quote, There was no room left to feel accomplishment. We were happy, but we couldn't believe it. Because we worked on the first Gran Turismo for a very long time, it really felt like the game belonged to the team. We held on to it and nurtured it until the very last possible moment. And then, that's when Gran Turismo suddenly wasn't ours anymore. His sentiment was true in more ways than one. Not only was the game now in the hands of consumers, Sony and Gran Turismo's competitors were also buying copies of the game and taking copious notes. Still, hopefully at some point, the numbness wore off and he could feel the true weight of what he and his team had accomplished. Gran Turismo would become the best-selling PlayStation 1 game of any genre with 10,850,000 units sold. Wow. Wow. That's insane. Pretty amazing. It's easy to see Gran Turismo as an anomaly, but if you look at the broader world of video games in 1998, a pattern emerges. A few years earlier, the technology to produce 3D games with somewhat realistic physics had emerged. 
By 1998, that technology had reached maturation, and many considered 98 to be not just a great year for video games, but perhaps the best ever. Gran Turismo was released in Europe and the United States in 1998. Other games of that year include Zelda Ocarina of Time, Starcraft, Half-Life, Baldur's Gate, and Thief, each one considered a classic that defines its genre. The common theme is originality. Of all of these titles, only Zelda is a sequel. Perhaps the closest comparison in the automotive world is Detroit in the 50s and 60s, when, after the war, designers leapfrogged over each other with a daring and imaginative designs. As unique a game as Gran Turismo was, it's also part of a giant wave of groundbreaking design and fresh ideas in the wider video game world. So, what was next for racing games in the aftermath of Gran Turismo? For one, the number of titles released each year was growing exponentially. Games were now spread across multiple consoles as well as PC and Mac. In a sense, Gran Turismo created a clear mandate for games. If Sony delivered the best overall realistic racing experience, other games would stand out by finding a niche subgenre or never-been-done gameplay mechanic. Originality was now valuable currency. It was the inverse of the arcade gaming scene of the 80s, when gaming companies raced to clone each other's games so that they could offer a competing product. Instead, the emphasis was on making a game that could stand out. Like making a kart racer with cartoon cats that features a weapon that lets you switch places with a car in front of them. I still cannot believe I haven't seen that in a racing game. <laughs> and why is there no hamburger cup? Or lasagna cup. <laughs> There's no mention of lasagna in the game at all. Oh, no, like, there is. That's the speed up. That's like the star, you know, in, in Mario Kart. Is lasagna. Is lasagna, which I thought was cute. One example of standing out is 1998's Colin McRae Rally. A follow-up to Sega's popular 1994 arcade and console game, Sega Rally Championship. Colin McRae Rally was developed by a British company known... As Codemasters. Big shout out to Codemasters. We Boom. love those guys. Dirt 5 available now. Nolan and I are both in it a lot. Now, Codemasters is perhaps best known for their Game Genie line of cheat cartridges for Nintendo and Super Nintendo at the time. Is that real? Did they do yeah. that? Yeah. Whoa. It led to Nintendo going crazy. after Codemaster in court. Perhaps the reason why the game was initially only available on PC and PlayStation. Whoa. Unlike previous huh. rally games, Colin McRae would put an increased emphasis on realism and simulation, allowing players to drive World Rally Championship cars like the Subaru Impreza WRC, Audi Quattro S1, and Ford RS200. Although the courses are fictional, they're based on real rally locations, including New Zealand, Monte Carlo, and the Greek Acropolis. Ooh. While driving, you hear the voices of Colin McRae and his real-life co-driver, Nikki Grist, calling out turns along the track. There's also a rally school where you can hear McRae give you pointers in a Scottish accent. The Colin McRae series was a success and would eventually morph into the Dirt series of games. That's right. The first Dirt was called Colin McRae's Dirt, I believe. Yeah. Eat my dirt. Eat my dirt. That's a great Colin McRae impression. <laughs> Yeehaw! <laughs> like, you've been to Scotland, so you know how they talk. Hey, get me some haggis. <laughs> <laughs> For its part, Gran Turismo 2, the 1999 sequel to the original, actually added rally events as a new feature, but they didn't reach the level of Colin McRae's gameplay. Clearly, there was room for games to find a niche. A 2001 <laughs> game that would also spawn a successful franchise was Burnout. Yes! Developed by British company Criterion Games, which had been created as an offshoot of Canon cameras. No kidding, huh? <laughs> the emphasis here... <laughs> <laughs> was not on the car, but on the environment. In fact, the cars in the game literally had generic names like Sports Coupe, Muscle, and Pickup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> While in development, mm -hmm. the game had actually been named Shiny Red Car <laughs> before they settled on Burnout. <laughs> Get out! No! <laughs> yeah, that's the working title. The feature most people remember from Burnout was, is not the driving, but the crashes. That's when right. you collide with either traffic or part of the course, your crash would replay from multiple angles in slow-mo. An instant highlight reel that somehow made your worst moments of driving look kind of cool. Hell yeah, dude. Your car also had a boost meter that filled up faster the closer you drove to oncoming traffic. Yeah. Incentivizing that you drive like an absolute yeah. maniac. Man, I spent... I spent hours, hours, days maybe playing Burnout and 
Ah, oh, God, I love these games, man. It's addictive. I just want to say that I was very, very good at Burnout. And uh, my favorite thing to do with that game was like when my friends would come over, I, I could beat anyone in any car. That was oh, my nice. thing. Because I understood the boost system really well. Anyway, mm-hmm. sorry, continue, James. I, I, I don't mean to brag. <laughs> you know. Uh, well, another fresh angle was explored in 1999's PC and PlayStation game Driver. I had this game. Oh, yeah. Which had the catchy subtitle of Driver. You are the wheel man. Driver's main feature was a story mode that you drove as a character, former race car driver and current NYPD officer John Tanner. In the game, which was inspired by the 1978 noir film The Driver and is similarly set in the 1970s, you go undercover and start driving missions for various criminals in the cities of Miami, San Francisco, L.A., and New York. In the final mission, you learn that the crime syndicate you're investigating has a secret plan to assassinate the president. Oh, no. And you get assigned to drive the president's car to safety. Driver was a fascinating development, a modern driving game that also delivered a narrative story. A review of the time noted that Driver excels where other games have failed by striking a perfect balance between action and realism. Car handling is a wonderful mixture of true physics and arcade functionality, not as nitpicky and sim-oriented as Gran Turismo. Oh, come on. That's that's an unnecessary thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While short of fully destructible environments, your car could drive through barriers like cones and construction signs, and collisions caused visible damage to your car. Driver was a commercial success and spawned several sequels. You know what game wasn't a commercial success and spawned several sequels? What? There is another driver-style game called The Wheel Man. Yeah. Um, I, it was, I think, on PS3 and Xbox 360, and kind of similar gameplay, a, a lot of emphasis on like very cinematic slow-mo moments. Do you guys know who played the titular main character of The Wheel Man? Nolan I North. just read it. Vin Diesel. Oh, cool. <laughs> I don't remember anything else about that game besides the fact that Vin Diesel was in it. Big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. What you might not know is that Valvoline is the original motor oil. They filed the first patent back in 1866 for motor oil but they've been constantly innovating since then. Some of those innovations have included the first high mileage oil, the first racing oil, and the first synthetic blend oil. All of Valvoline's oils have been proven to maximize engine life. So let's talk about Valvoline's advanced full synthetic blend. This blend is proven to maximize engine life. Now with 40% better wear protection than industry standards, when you think of engine breakdown, you think of four different causes, wear, friction, heat, and deposits. You don't have to worry about any of those with Valvoline oils. They also have advanced protection for stop and go driving, which is, you know, how most of us drive. 25% better deposit protection than industry standard, and everything meets or exceeds GF6 standards. What about Valvoline's full synthetic high mileage oil? It's proven to maximize engine life after 75,000 miles, which is, you know, when stuff starts to break down in your car. It's got 50% better wear protection than industry standards, 10 times better protection against heat, 25% better deposit protection than industry standard too. It is the first high mileage motor oil. All of Valvoline oils exceed industry standards to bring you the best protection for your engine. And Valvoline is the only motor oil with a dedicated engine lab where they run specialized tests and standardized engine tests right in their own facility. This way the scientists at Valvoline can just keep on innovating. And some of our best friends use Valvoline. So like Chris Forsberg, Mario Andretti, I almost said Wario Andretti, AJ Foyt, Daryl Waltrip. They don't know, but they're our best friends. Jeff Gordon, everybody knows Jeff Gordon. So yeah, Valvoline makes some of the best oils around and they're also the original motor oil. So thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode. Go buy their oil. Of course, no game would combine storytelling and driving like 2001's smash hit Grand Theft Auto 3. Yeah, baby. The previous two games in the franchise had been commercial successes while also becoming media punching bags for their violent and sexual themes. Grand Theft Auto 3 took all of that to a new level, literally by swooping down from the bird's eye view camera angle that had given the first two GTA games a somewhat cartoonish feel and putting you in a third person perspective in a fully 3D world. Sprinkled amongst the prostitutes and gang members, GTA 3 included 56 fictional cars clearly based on real-life makes and models. American Motors is GM. Grote is Ferrari, with a logo of a horse sitting on its rear end. BF, short for Burger Farzug, is Volkswagen. (laughs) 
Burger Farzug actually translates to Citizen's Vehicle, clearly a parody of the People's Car. Huh. I think Rockstar is like the funniest. They got the funniest writer's room. They're very good. Yeah. They're, you know? they're detail-oriented. Like Gran Turismo, they're very detail-oriented too, but Rockstar, like, I feel like that's the place where we would work. Yeah. Those guys are actually Brits. The main yeah. Rockstar Studios over there in Britain. Yeah, they're, and che- they're cheeky. You they love tell. taking taking shots at us Americans, you know, maybe <laughs> yeah. maybe very well justified, but uh, no, they're very great. I, Grand, Grand Theft Auto V is one of the best games I've ever played. They're really milking that multiplayer for all it's worth. I would really like to see a Grand Theft Auto VI at some point, but I don't know if we're ever going to get it. Grand Theft Auto saw game design close a conceptual loop that existed since the origins of driving games in the 1970s. People initially wanted to play driving games to simulate a more exciting version of something they did in real life, drive. But now there was a video game that made driving just another activity among countless options, exactly like real life. This was real life where you could do whatever you wanted without consequences beyond virtual police gunning you down from a helicopter. The appeal was obvious. While GTA couldn't be called a racing game, although it does feature the occasional race, driving is a huge part of it. After all, auto is right there. I mean, it's right there in the title. True, man. That's true. You got me, you got me there, dude. Yeah. Uh, and this makes GTA by far the best-selling driving franchise of all time, with nearly $350 oh million in total sales, putting it behind only Mario, Tetris, and Pokemon in the list of the best-selling game franchises of all time. Crazy. Rockstar Games, the makers of GTA, actually did end up making their own racing game. Oh, yeah. In 2000, the San Diego division of the company released Midnight Club Uh based on the real world Tokyo Street Racing Club that we've discussed at length on previous past gas episodes. In Midnight Club, you start the game with what is essentially a stock factory car. And through winning races against club members, you win vehicles and parts to incrementally upgrade your abilities. Like GTA and Drive, the races were set on a city map with dynamic courses that could take you down the same road. Between races, you would cruise for action oh. around the city and search for your next event. Ooh, cruising for action. Um, I love Midnight Club 3. Uh, maybe my favorite racing game ever. I sp- Again, m- the only game I spent more time with than Burnout 2 was Midnight Club 3. And I think a large part of my appeal to it is the amount of music that they have in this game. The soundtrack yeah. is amazing, and that's also one of Rockstar's strengths, is that they're, they're able to somehow get licenses with tons of great songs. There was like uh, How We Do by uh, The Game was on there. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of great... Uh, I'm not going to say any more titles of hip-hop songs because I, I will not make them sound cool. But... um. A lot of great music. In fact, it inspired me to make my own dream racing game uh, original soundtrack. If you guys would like to check that out, it is on Spotify. It's called Nolan's Dream Racing OST. Um, Just imagine that you're playing like an open world racing game. Put the shuffle on and just listen. I think it's I think it's pretty good. Did you used to drive like a an Escalade in that game? I think I did have an Escalade at one point. The trucks were not my favorite. They were kind of slow. Uh, my favorite car was probably the McLaren F1 um, on there. Oh, the, oh they, they have had, a Dodge Magnum in there, too. Oh, that's in the uh, Tokyo edition. That was like a one that came out later that had Tokyo as an included map. But great game, Midnight Club 3. Love that. By the 2000s, console gaming had entered what is known as the 6th gen era. This included games on the PlayStation 2, Nintendo GameCube, Microsoft Xbox, and the short-lived Sega Dreamcast. Games had moved... From 8-bit to 16-bit to 64-bit, hence Nintendo 64 and beyond. But while power was still relevant, it was becoming increasingly clear that games were only as good as the ideas behind them. Graphical advances had created an avalanche of memorable titles, but the major game developers were increasingly less focused on original games and were instead choosing to make as many sequels as possible to commercially successful games. In the racing genre, this meant that Burnout would get seven sequels, Gran Turismo would get six sequels, and Need for Speed would get an eye-popping 23 follow-up games in the franchise. A lot of variance in the Need for Speed quality, I would say. Mm -hmm. There's some really great ones, like Need for Speed Most Wanted, and there's some not-so-good ones, like Need for Speed Pro Street. Of course, sequel doesn't automatically mean bad game. In fact, some of them were stone-cold classics. You got 2004's Burnout 3 Takedown, 
great game. And and 2005's Need for Speed Most Wanted, for example, are considered by many to be the pinnacles of their franchises, many iterations deep into their lifespans. Chief among them in the 6th gen era is Gran Turismo 3 A-Spec for the PlayStation 2, widely considered to be one of the greatest games of all time in any genre, although I will argue that Gran Turismo 4 is more enjoyable. That's a personal preference thing. Kazunori Yamauchi used the expanded capabilities of the PS2 to push his obsession with detail even further, with masterful touches like waves of heat across the cars as they idled on the starting line, and sun glare as you circled the track on a cloudless day. The AI was also a leap forward, with Kazunori's team claiming to have developed, quote, emotion physics, meaning that if you passed a car or cut it off, the computer driver would react and try to retaliate. Very advanced. And oh yeah, Snoop Dogg wrote a song specifically as a tribute to Gran Turismo 3. Here are Do some it. of the, rap it. the sample yeah, Nolan, lyrics. Rap it. Okay. <laughs> rap it, rap it, Nolan. Sliding, slipping, smashing off. I take the lead while others crash the wall. Doggy, D-O-double-G in the <laughs> Gran Turismo 3. Damn. Wait, they had they had him swear. They had to. Song? They probably uh, censored it. Yeah, it's called Snoop's Turismo. Um, definitely <laughs> recommend listening to it. Is it on uh, your playlist? It needs to be. No, it's not. I got to do that. Um, and that's also not to mention the menu music, which is some of the smoothest jazz fusion uh, since <laughs> Brew. Uh, Miles Davis, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, there is no best racing game, just like there is no best car. These games existed to give you joy, just like the cars we love. The 90s and 2000s were an amazing time for the racing genre, because developers were coming up with games custom-tailored to pretty much every type of gamer and driving enthusiast. So, what was next for this newly minted generation of racing game fans to look forward to as we barreled into the 21st century? The answer was threefold. First was AAA titles from big name developers, your Gran Turismo's and Need for Speeds. These were the Marvel movies of the industry, largely predictable, but still, they're Marvel movies and nothing can quite match them in terms of production value. The second was an opposite side of the spectrum, the blossoming indie game scene, enabled by new platforms like Steam, Xbox Marketplace, and yes, smartphone app stores. These allowed just about anyone to become a game developer. Finally. There was a third category that was becoming an increasingly popular option, something I'm very excited to talk about. Sim racing platforms like R-Factor and iRacing that were somewhere in between a game and real racing itself. That's all coming up next time on Past Gas as we give you the finale of our history of racing games from AAA to Indie, from iRacing to iPhone gaming. What is the current state of racing games today and what can it tell us about where we might be heading? That was a fun episode, guys. I love this era of gaming. It really, it's very nostalgic, obviously. I was basically a kid. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Make sure to check out my racing game soundtrack. Let me know what you think. Hit me up on Twitter or Instagram, at Nolan J. Sykes. Follow my co-host, my lovely, beautiful co-hosts, at Joe G. Weber and at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut uh, on all social media. Follow us on YouTube if for some reason you don't. Subscribe to us, Donut Media. We make car videos as well as podcasts. Okay, that's been Past Gas, History of Racing Games, Part 2. Next week, Part 3. See you guys then. Bye. Be kind. Keep your turkey juice. <laughs> <laughs>